I keep thinking when I was a kid on the farm where I wanted to be as an artist. And I think to have my painting then featuring Snoop Dogg's brand new track, that doesn't calculate for me because it's, that's just so wild and we all know who he is, right? It's yeah. not like it's yeah. someone unknown. That's a huge blessing. You know, when, when the guys approached me about that, I was like, oh yeah, no, this, yeah, no, we're, we're doing this, yeah. right? But at the same time, when I actually heard the track, I was like, I can't do this, right? And I had to make a decision to either just say no or find a way that I could actually work with it. This is Start Up the Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is James Peter Henry, the artist best known for painting the mural in our very own studio. Okay, maybe that's not his most famous piece of work, but it's certainly up there in our books. James grew up on a farm in rural Australia, about five hours outside of Melbourne. As he explored the property as a kid, he discovered a set of caves that were adorned with Aboriginal paintings and drawings. These fascinated him and would go on to influence his work all throughout his life. The Aboriginal artists were painting on the walls of the cave in order to pass down stories. Each of James's pieces today reflects this notion of art as a vessel for storytelling. But instead of being featured on the walls of caves, they've been projected onto the sails of the Sydney Opera House. So listen in as we cover everything from why he almost talked himself out of his career, why he considers his paintings to be similar to real estate, and how his darkest moment came when he accidentally spilled five gallons of black paint on himself. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show. The muralist, the artist, the man, the myth, the legend behind the wall, James Peter Henry. Thanks for joining. Hey guys, how are you? How did you first get into art? Or I don't even know if you call it art. Maybe expression is the better word. You know, I was about five or six and there wasn't much to do on the farm. So I just started drawing and just just kept drawing. And then when I realized that there was caves up in my parents' farm full of Aboriginal art, well, more storytelling, actually, you know, storytelling of the generations and all that. I started coming down from the mountains and writing what I saw and, you know, drawing and it's sort of like adding stuff to what I'd seen previously. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, like six or seven, I don't know. I remember my auntie staying at my house for a couple of weeks and she said, it's three o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? I'm like, I have to draw. I have to draw. And she's like, okay. Um, so it's, it's always been a part of me, always. Did you have any influences from that early age, like anything you were trying to emulate? No, because I, I, you know, we didn't have internet, we didn't have any art books. My mum, she did a little bit, but, you know, it's probably like six or seven drawings. So I, I saw that and I thought that was amazing. A little bit of cubism, but yeah, I had no idea. Did people try to sway you away from it? Were they like, oh, it's cute. He just has this high, this little thing he does until 3 a.m., but it's a, it'll go away. You know, I, I swayed myself away from it. Okay. Yeah. Around, like, high school or, like... Yeah, I was just like, you know, I don't want to be a poor artist. Mm -hmm. So I think that was why I turned away from it for a while. But I think when you're in purpose or when you know what your purpose is and you're trying to, like, fight it and trying to not to do it because it's not exactly going with what your best friends are doing, you know what I mean? Whether they went to law school or, or whatever. And then like, and, and you want to be an artist, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, hey, this is not cool. Yeah, it and, sounds crazy. Yeah, I sure. mean, completely crazy. And you know, there's no A, B, C step to being an artist. You know, if you want to be a doctor, you know right. where you need to go, what you need to study. It's very linear. Right, and as an artist, it's like, okay, well, I've been painting this thing now for 20 hours. What purpose is that? oh, people love it, great. But then it's kind of like, but what did I do it for? So I think just through years of just finding my style and yeah, I mean, it just, just happened. I think if, like everyone, if they're in that purpose, it's going to happen regardless. Yeah, you know totally I mean? true. It's just how, it's how it is. You know, it's like when someone wants to be a singer, right? And they probably shouldn't sing, 
but they keep forcing it, right? And it doesn't really happen for them. Where well, you've got those other ones that are so talented that whatever they do, they just keep, you know, going, going up, 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 and up. So, yeah. you know, yeah, I think it's just really about finding your purpose and not worrying about what your family or your friends are doing or whether it's about money. It's not about that at all. So at what point did you realize that you had a gift and that you were more than just, like these were more than just doodles? Like I know you said you talked yourself out of it in high school, but had you realized like that you were actually quite good at it by then or did it take a while after that? You know, it's, it's kind of weird. It, it, it's like if you're focused on something, I, I believe you can do anything. Like really focused. I mean, but you have to focus for a long time. It's got to, it takes time. It does. It's a, like yeah. years of focus. It, it, it does. I mean, and it's also, it's, it's about a confident level as well about being confident in what you're doing. I mean, as, as, as a kid being an artist, I mean, that's all fine. Your mom and dad say that you're great and your best friends say that you're great. <laughs> right. I mean, right. that, that adds up to a certain amount, but then when you become, you know, you know, like early early 20s you have to then make a serious decision about okay is this going to actually put food in my fridge is this going to pay my rent and then I realized that whatever I was doing was selling I was like oh, that's strange like I'm just doing from what's in here like you know what I feel so I put it onto paper and then there was interest in galleries there was interest in people you know purchasing and yeah there was just an interest so then I had to explore that interest to see if it was actually a valid interest as well, to see if it was actually going to take me to where I wanted to go, because I knew exactly where I wanted to go with it. Oh, where did you want to go? I mean, when I was a kid, I always dreamed that... I have very vivid dreams, very dreams that are very... I, I can see exactly what I'm doing, like in... 10, 20 years time. So this happened when I was a kid. So I knew that I was going to do really large scale paintings in Los Angeles. And this is me living on a farm five hours from Melbourne. I'm like, okay. I mean, that I, I don't know how that's going to happen. You know, first I need a green card and then, I mean, it just, nothing made sense. But when I was doing the Melrose mural, I started laughing and my friend said, what are you laughing about? I said, well, A, you're meant to be holding onto the ladder and you're on Instagram, <laughs> but don't worry about me. And B, I, I saw this already happening. So I see all those things. I'm not sure if that's a normal thing, but I mean, I definitely had a vision to keep going, even though sometimes it was extremely hard financially and just everything. I just made a decision to stick to, to it because it's actually the only thing that actually made sense to me. I was just like, nah, I can't do anything else. Did you ever have to become like an art historian at some point where you're doing research or uh, maybe not research, but at least like drawing inspiration from different forms of art or just kind of exploring the full art world and then maybe thinking like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Because everything at some point is just inspiration, right? We've, we've all been inspired, especially when you think about music and stuff like that. And so did you at some point become like a historian or just? Look, I, because of my parents' farm with the Aboriginal art, I mean, that was my first taste of, I, I didn't even call it art back then. It was storytelling. Mm -hmm. So I'm very inspired by ancient art. So African, Aboriginal, Egyptian, you know, people always say, you know, who's your favorite artist? And I, I actually don't have one. I'm more about you know, ancient art, that's where, I mean, that's where all art is that's from where anyway. started, just you know what I mean? Extent, yeah. Absolutely. That's where I draw from because I never want to draw from anything else that's in vogue or that's, you know, that's been around for a few years because I don't want a blueprint of someone else's art. So I'd rather draw from the source mm -hmm. than from someone else. So, you know, yeah, so it, ancient art is, is what I studied and what I grew up with as well. I have a cousin who, uh, he was an art, he was an engineer. He's like this engineer in Canada. And at some point he like became an artist and started making art, but he was still working as an engineer. But what was interesting is like, he's this PhD engineer, but at the same time, he's in this like art community in Canada all of a sudden because of his art. And what he's realizing is none of these people, like what holds them back is their inability to sell themselves effectively or their inability to have confidence in what to charge for their art. And so they become literally starving artists. 
and his view on it wasn't so much that they were not good at art. It was like they were so good at it that they were so bad at everything else. Yeah. And it was this thing where he himself realized like he was all of a sudden becoming the most profitable artist in that group just because he would sell at high prices and those high prices would lend him into meeting the right people. He almost became not liked by that community because of his ascension. Yeah. And he was just explaining to me like you have to charge enough to be able to eat to your point but it's it's hard right i think it's hard for entrepreneur i think it's hard for everybody to like know your worth essentially when it came for you to like start charging for your art you know what was that what was the first days of that like and do you remember the first piece that you sold wow uh, one million dollars yeah <laughs> um yeah bitcoin um <laughs> <laughs> no i don't remember the first piece but i always remember the a statement or conversation, I can't really remember, that I was always going to keep my prices high. I never wanted to sell something for 10 bucks, 20 bucks. I mean, I, I always saw the longevity of my career. Okay. So if I'm doing an original piece, you know, okay, back then it was worth nothing, maybe, $5, $10, but I knew if I held on to that for five years, 10, 20, that you know it's a little bit like stock or it's it's like or no actually you know it's really like property mm -hmm. so you know you you buy a house for 50,000 you know in 10 years time it's 250 or whatever so i i always look at my paintings yeah more like property mm -hmm. um regardless of what size you know it could be just like 6 inches by 6 inches mm -hmm. but i've always been like that because i've always seen where i'm going to go so i think a lot of artists a little bit blurry about where they're going to go. You know, they might be amazing, but they can't see what is ahead for them. I always have, so I'm always like, okay, so this is the price this year, next year it's this, the following year it's this, and this, and this. I love that. So for you, it's not like a tactic. It's something that just happens because you know where your destination yeah. is. And this is something that I think people get lost on. They, they think it's like a tactic game, or like, let's go with the high price to influence the market. But in reality... It should just be pure. It's not a tactic. It's not a strategy. It's just something that you know you're going to be doing this forever. Yeah. And so, frankly, you give a shit and you want that to, you want it to represent it in your Absolutely. price. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's why you do up a house to get more, you know, when it goes for sale. I mean, you're always adding stuff to it, always, you know, improving it to add more value to the house. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm always doing as well. You know, like whether it's murals or whether it's, collaborations or paintings I'm always adding to the pie to make sure that pie is growing in many directions and not just with you know maybe paintings in the studio but it's paintings overseas it's murals it's collaborations it's all that stuff at what point did you move to LA at what point was that dream realized yeah was it as simple as hopping on a plane in Australia and <sighs> getting off at LAX no, From it wasn't. Farm. It came after a divorce, actually. And I was just like, damn, I don't want to be doing this anymore. You know, I was painting, but I was also in the music industry as well. And I was a producer, but I was always painting. I mean, that didn't stop. It was just a bit of a diversion. And I got a green card and I was like, okay, it's time. I, it just, it's been time for a long time, mm -hmm. but it, I just knew that everything had to be sold. And one suitcase it was carry-on bag, actually, and that's it, nothing else. And um, I came to L.A. seven and a half years ago. So 2013, 2014? Yeah, just the end of 2013, yeah. And then I painted basically nonstop for three years. Where? Where um, were you? In my house in, um, down the road, Beverly Hills. Okay. And I was just, just kept painting and painting and painting. Then I went to New York for a while and I had this big canvas, this six by five feet canvas, which I rolled up and would take to Central Park every single day. Just kept painting, kept painting. And then uh, a mutual friend said, hey, you should meet this guy. He owns a gallery. He might like your stuff. I said, yeah, all right, let's, uh, let's work it out. He goes, oh, it's 3 o'clock tomorrow. I said, oh, what's his name? Oh, he's a Guggenheim. I said, what? And anyway, <laughs> so I went, I went to his place and he said, what's the canvas? I said, oh, just a painting. And he said, like, you're going to show me? I said, oh, yep, all right. So he bought it right there and then. 
and that sort of pivoted things to a different angle as well. So you sold your first painting in New York to a Guggenheim. Yes. <laughs> so it was then, was it sold to the Guggenheim or was that for his private collection? For a private collection, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, and th you know, things just kind of kept moving. So New York Fashion Week, but it wasn't a shock. It was almost like, oh, okay. Yeah, this is all what right. we're supposed to... This is meant to happen, this is meant to happen. And it's been happening all my life through different things, through my art. But I mean, when you come to a new a new country, a new city, and I actually didn't know anyone at all. So I'm like, great. I feel like I'm 18, I've got to get a driver's license again. I had no credit. I mean, it was just a whole... Did he try to help you in other ways? Was he like, oh, let's do this, 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 this? Or was it more of like, okay, this is interesting? Yeah, it did. But I mean, it didn't really pan off the way that that was meant to, just due to him being so busy and myself as well. So then I came back to LA and, you know, I just wanted to do a lot of murals because I thought that was a, a good way to express what I have inside to the general public, more so than people that go to galleries and go to museums. I wanted to explore the avenue of putting fine art on buildings as opposed to spraying. And I mean, I, I didn't want to be a graffiti artist. I wanted to be a fine artist that was painting on buildings instead. Now at this time, so Instagram isn't a thing yet. And so at this time, I don't know if this was a thought process for you, but it's almost like an artist having a website is kind of tough because you got to keep sharing your website. Emails are probably there, but it's like, is a mural also just a way to showcase your art to a substantial amount of people in a really kind of like an Instagram way where it's like, there's a lot, it's a platform with a lot it's of users. hard to ignore. Yeah. yeah, it is. And I think that's why, you know, I chose the places that mm -hmm. the, my murals are. You know, I, I didn't want to put it in a place where people couldn't see it. I mean, there's no point, but I- Were you wanted... offered places like that and turned them down? Yeah. yeah. Like this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I mean, there's, I, I just, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, the one on Melrose, I mean, that was, that was a massive one for me. Is that the employee? No. Ah, that's uh, table art. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, I want people to stand back and look. I want people to sit and understand the story but also how it affects them as well. You know what I mean? That's, that's what I want to do. I, I want to provoke people. I want them to, you know, it's this guy that was in the studio a couple of months ago and, you know, he is a like seven foot basketballer and uh, started crying. And it wow. was because the painting was provoking, you know, the, all these emotions of, about what he'd been through and what the painting was about. And that's art to me. You know, I mean, that's if, if we're moving someone and if they can walk away in a place where they haven't thought of before, in a positive way, I mean, I'm all about that. It's like when you say to your partner, hey, babe, I love you, right? And that thought is with her for the rest of the day. You know what I mean? I think if we can inspire people and and help them see what's more beautiful than the mess that's around us. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm all about that. James, what was your favorite collaboration you've had to date? The favorite collaboration? Besides the mural behind me. Obviously, I was going to say that, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was a great collaboration. What I loved about it was I would come here at the end of the day and I would see you at like six, seven o'clock. Yeah. And it was like your happy place. And then you were here until like 2 a.m. And for people listening, we had no light. Like we had no electricity here yet. We only had temporary electricity. And so he was basically painting in the dark right. to some extent, which yeah. was even cooler. And you think about it, like, at least for me, it was like, this is, it basically was like a Zen. There was a Zen to the room. Yeah. It was a meditation studio versus uh, like a, so an peaceful. art studio with all this light everywhere. But you know, I didn't actually need to see what I was doing either. We can tell. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nick thought you put six fingers on this woman, but it's just the bisecting line. Yeah, I mean... He was like, he put six fingers on her. I mean, I, I should like, have. Oh my I God. mean... Nick's yeah, but I mean, like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hater. Painting this space was amazing because it was quiet and away from the traffic and yeah, it's just 
my space to paint, whereas the studio can be very busy. When you finish pieces, so like when I think about real estate development, like this project as an example, typically once they're open, so once the business is up and running and the, it's done, I'm out. Like I'm mentally like on to the next one. And I know that's a survivor component to my life, but there's another part of me that's almost like I really want to stay in this space of enjoying this. But I feel like once I'm done with it, it's not for me anymore. It's for the people, right? So like people come to the coffee shop, like it's for them. The brewery will open. It's like I'm there to build it. And then once it's done, it's for them. And so it's almost like I'm giving it away. And because I give it away, I don't want it back. And I want to go somewhere else now. Do you ever deal with that when it comes to pieces? I mean, when people buy paintings from the studio, I'm just really so much inclined to say, look, pay me your money, but let's just keep it here. Okay. And you can just come and visit it. I, it it's like... It's like a kid. Yeah. It, it, it's like How much kids. for my kid? <laughs> right. Right. How much for the firstborn? I mean, like, e- even looking at this mural, there's a journey that I've gone through. I mean, you know, I talked about this woman's journey that she's on. It's her journey, but it's an, a journey that I've experienced as well. Yeah. You know, the, the journey of the artist going, holy crap, what am I going to do? Holy crap. You know, and it, it always happens, but it's, it's that journey. It's that journey of, you know, working at the studio for like nine hours and coming here. And it's the, the little things that I see driving here when I was doing the mural that I was like, oh, I need to do that. And I need to do that. It's those sleepless nights that I think, oh, yeah. that figuring out what's happening the paranoia that happens you know whether someone's going to like it or whether someone's going to hate it i mean it's all this all these stories that i tell myself right how do you quiet that oh like the, look I, as far the as judgment i guess or potential judgment i, I just i just shut it off yeah. i just like i don't care about it anymore do you find that there's a certain like you know you, you painting here at the wee hours of the morning, do you find that there's a certain time of day where you're able to achieve that a little bit easier, the, the quieting of the mind? Like, do you work better at night, per se? No, it, it used to be like two or three o'clock in the morning. That was my sweet spot, just to paint. But now it's like how an actor goes from being in a day-to-day life to switching straight into character. I mean, that stuff normally takes years to, to get to that point and also to get out of character right and I think for me when I paint I can switch I, I know how, I know where the switch is now whereas beforehand I didn't know where that switch was so now I can almost physically put my hand in my head and go okay turn that on or turn it off so I, I know where it is so you know before it used to be like yeah I need to make sure that that everything is clean in my house, everything is clean in my studio, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this. I mean, all these stupid things I used to do, right? I need to burn this incense and then this incense. It's like, no, just, I just know where that switch is. So I switch straight into it. That's fascinating. It's yeah. Like you learned how to silence it at the beginning and then at some point you just realized that there's just one switch. It's not so much about silencing the noise. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like a recipe. Once, you know, the first time you make that cake, you know, you're going through the recipe. It's like, yeah, I'm trying to get this to happen. The oven's on. I mean, there's a whole thing, right? And you've been doing it for years. You know exactly. You know, it's, you're just on autopilot. It's like, yeah, the oven's on. I've got this. I've got that. Great. You know, eat it. Everyone loves it. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask, and we're back. Do you have any interests people wouldn't know that you have? Like, is there any, I don't know, just any hobbies that are so, like, basically it's almost like you're so immersed in your studio and then then doing your work. Is there something that is, there's an escape for you? Is it meditation? Is it prayer? Is it? It's definitely prayer, but I mean, you know, I'll go to the beach maybe three times a week, like really, really early in the morning. I mean, before sun comes up, and I'll just walk down the beach and pray. I'll sometimes dip a little bit into the cold water. That's my, like... You tune out? Yeah, it's just really grounds me. It takes me away from 
busy life and where I live, you know, is busy. Just quietens everything. Yeah. Completely quiets everything. You know, I grew up on a farm for 18 years. Right. You know, with... Was it a sense of home to the quiet? Yeah, I need that. Yeah. I was doing a mural in downtown and it's three o'clock in the morning and I moved the ladder, which wasn't a good thing because I just had a five gallon bucket of paint that I opened and put up on top of the ladder. And then it decided to just come down and cover me completely with black paint. I mean, that was a shock because I couldn't hear anything, see anything. Can you imagine that on a marble staircase going down 13 floors? Oh, black my paint. God. Probably looked cool after. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, it was yeah. when, when, <laughs> when, when I realized it was 3 a.m. and I couldn't see and I, I couldn't hear anything and I just had all this paint. I was like, all right, now you got to try and clean this off. Yeah. So I basically took off everything except for my underwear. I went downstairs and there's footprints all down the marble staircase and I'm washing myself in the hand basin at probably 3.30 in the morning. Were you happy that no one was around where you could just kind of like... I don't know if, know if I would choose the word happy, but yeah. I, I mean... It's better. Uh, all I wanted to do was see and hear. I mean, yeah. that was... I could feel the handrail going down right, and it was right. slipping with black paint. I mean, it was five gallons of black paint. It's a lot. This reminds me of Natalia and I, that house in the Hollywood Hills. Someone was coming to like see the house. We were selling it and we're just putting everything away. And I don't know why I decided to do this, but I decided to grab like one too many paint cans and it spilled. It like fell on the ground, just like the normal gallon. And it was everywhere. And these people were like, were, they were texting us being like, oh, we're three minutes away. And this was like a really important showing. Cause they were, <laughs> it was like, we had already sold it to some extent. They were just like coming back to like, make sure everything was fine and do some sizing. Yeah. And then Tali and I just go into like a panic of having to clean this up in three minutes. Oh my God. And it was black paint. Oh. And there was like wood like this. There was like wood grain. And so it was getting into the grain. Oh, would it love so, to be in a fly on that wall? Yeah. It right. was a mess. Oh. A mess. And so we had to like obviously paint thinner, the whole thing. Luckily we had all this stuff. And then at the end they left and they were like, oh, we noticed that it was like this area of wood was like a little darker. And we we're like, oh, we'll Different just vacuum tree. it. <laughs> oh my so like it was 11 it's bad hour. enough that you spill the the paint but like you have a ticking clock yeah, as well it was, not, it was not fun i thought i forgot about that moment but when you brought oh, your yeah, moment, I was gonna say, i've never heard that story before yeah no we buried that story yeah, <laughs> yeah. well it's alive now it's alive that, was a, now. that must have been a dark moment it was not i mean you could imagine her too. yeah she was not yeah. very kind and it was my fault i mean i shouldn't have done that i was dumb let's talk about your collabs Oh. NFT, you're in the NFT game now, which is fascinating. Uh -huh. NFTs come out, they're good in theory, help the artist, help the artist protect their digital rights. Mm -hmm. You made a video with Snoop Dogg. What has that been like for you? I mean, I don't know. I, I keep thinking when I was a kid on the farm where I wanted to be as an artist. And I think like to, to have a, my painting then featuring Snoop Dogg's brand new track. I mean, that, that doesn't calculate for me because it's, that's just so wild. And I mean, we all know who he is, right? Yeah. It's not like it's yeah. someone unknown. And it's like, um, and that's going to be forever with me, you know, which I think is amazing. I mean, that's a, that's a huge blessing. You know, when, when the guys approached me about that, I was like, oh, yeah, no, this, yeah, no, we're, we're doing this, yeah. right? But at the same time, when I actually heard the track, I was like, I can't do this. I mean, it was full on, right? And I had to make a decision to either just say no or find a way that I could actually work with it. So, so you pushed back a little bit. I on did, yeah. The I mean, concept. it wasn't exactly what I wanted. To. Were they shocked when you put? Were they like, do you know who you're pushing back to, or do they not? Do they understand the the artistic community in that way? It was more my manager that I expressed okay. the whoa. It was like chalk and cheese it was like i mean yeah, it, how, how can this work and then one of my friends suggested that my paintings are actually about what the song is about it's just that you know like when, when i'm doing a collaboration i mean someone will have their point of view and it w won't be aligned with what i'm thinking whatsoever so it's a it's a automatic resistance 
and then I have to step back and understand why that resistance is there and, and then work with that. It's therapy. It is. I mean, it teaches me how to expand myself as an artist and how to, to deliver something that not necessarily is something that I would have thought of. So, I mean, I actually like it. I, beforehand, you know, f- five years ago, it'd be like, yeah, no, that's never going to happen. But when it comes to me now, it's like, okay, all right, so this has come for a reason. How do we turn this to create another space in my mind? That's a healthy approach in anything, really. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we always have to grow, right? Yeah. It's like a relationship. It's like, you know, sometimes you just have to stand back Put ego aside. Yeah. And then your Kobe Bryant jacket, working with uh, Mr. Hamilton. Yeah, Jeff. So you did the painting first, mm-hmm. right? So I did the painting probably about 10 days after the accident. And I was approached by the city to do a big mural of Kobe. And I declined it because I wasn't really feeling it. I, I, wasn't, you know, I wanted to honor Kobe and I didn't have anything in my mind or I wasn't really resonating. All I knew was just a a very sad story. And I didn't know how that would portray on a massive wall. Like, I mean, massive wall. Yeah, I I didn't do that project. And then I think about 10 days later, I started drawing Kobe's face. I didn't even realize that's what I was doing. And then I did Gigi as well. And I mean, it just kind of happened and it became a whole thing with the whole Kobe. It's and a then, beautiful piece. Thank you. For sure. And then it's, now it's been animated as well. Right. And then that, Which is amazing. I'm, yeah. I'm hoping we can put this in the tease because it's like, honestly, it's such a beautiful, it grabs you. There's no question about it. It really takes you to a place. Yeah. The animator that I use, Patrick, I mean, he just got it. Yeah. You know, I've used other animation people before and they haven't got what I'm trying to, to put forward. Mm-hmm. But this guy, Patrick, I mean, he's, he's brilliant. You know, when someone rips you up about and, you know, tries to put it on something else, I'm always like, what's this going to end up like? But, I mean, I said to him, I'd prefer your animation than the actual painting. You know, it's, it's so beautiful. Did it require <laughs> a conversation between you and the animator in order for him to, like you said, get your art and where it was coming from in order to highlight certain a- aspects of it? Or was yeah, it just like... Uh, I mean... A very, very quick conversation on a very windy street and with bad reception. And he said, look, I'll send you something and then you tell me what you think. Anyway, he sent it to me. He goes, I haven't finished it. This is just a rough draft. And I said, this is perfect. Really? I mean, it's he, stunning. He it grabs all of it. completely got me. And I the was moving basketball. Oh, man. And yeah. the stairs. And... I was so surprised. But, I mean, the basketball goes up to the stairway of heaven and... And then Kobe's reaching out, and then it, then Kobe in the back drop is then slam dunking the ball. I mean, it's it's kind of like when you're creating something from scratch, like a project, like a building, mm-hmm. and then you see it at its you know final stages. Mm-hmm. It's it's like you know like this place. You know, you see it when before it was gutted, and you see it when it was gutted, and you see it now. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible journey. For, you know, through everything that happened, through you know, getting electricity to, to everything. So once you have the piece, and then does Jeff approach? Like, how does how does it become the point where let's put this on a jacket? Let's make a jacket out of the piece. Yeah, I mean the jacket with Jeff Hamilton. We spoke about it last year about let's work on a on a jacket together. We did choose another piece of artwork, and I wasn't feeling it. I'm like you know a lot of his you know his fans, his friends are a very sports orientated. So I wanted to do something that was related to sport. And then, you know, the Kobe piece had already been done. So anyway, so Jeff did the Kobe painting. It's incredible. I mean, it just, it's alive. Yeah. There's something about that jacket that is just like, whoa. And then when you see it, the Chinese theater transferred into a hologram and it's spinning with Kobe's voice on the speakers at the Chinese theater with the painting of Kobe animated all over the Chinese theater. It's just like this silence. Feels yeah. very ground zero in that way. Yeah. It, it definitely takes you back. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're doing this thing with the sales of the Sydney Opera House. Oh. 
one of the most iconic places in the world. I have to say, out of all the, the things that I've, I've seen of your work, that was just the most jaw-dropping to be able to see that projection. And, you know, I wasn't there in yeah, person. You, you had I showed me, it. like, the pr- what you were yeah. doing. Right. And I was like, oh, God, that's cool. Yeah. But then seeing it was like, holy shit. I mean, yeah. it was a moment of, like, that's it's, it's one of the most iconic buildings in the world. And to see something like that projected onto the sails and to come alive, especially at night, and it's it's so perfectly aligned, it was truly a spectacle to behold, and that was even over like my phone on Instagram. <laughs> I can only imagine in person. Are you becoming a diva? Yes. <laughs> you feel like yes. your head is exploding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My name is Mariah Carey. <laughs> Do you no, have I, handlers now? How yeah. many? Yeah, I mean, the Sydney Opera House was you know, something that was talked about six months ago, and I pushed it away. Not pushed it away, but I just thought, okay. I mean, my friends worked it out in Sydney, and I didn't think anything of it. And then only weeks ago, they're like, oh, the Sydney Opera House thing is confirmed. I'm like, what actually are we doing? Yeah. Right. They asked me to do something that was related to the Great Barrier Reef because it was for uh, the UN World Ocean Day. So it was all about, you know, about the ocean, about the fish, mm-hmm. about the coral reefs, all about that. So I had to do a painting related to that, which I said to them, you know, you know what I paint and it's not reefs. It's not fish. Right. But then that comes back to what we were talking about before, about, you know, with collaborations and then, you know, that resistance and then pushing through that. And then, you know, I had to do it on paper. I had to use acrylics and, and graphite and a few things like that. That was quick drying because that very next day it had to be scanned and sent to Sydney. How do they scan it? What kind of scanner is it? Just like a regular computer scanner? Or is it like a legit? Yeah, I, I take color? my stuff to uh, to a place in Culver City, um, and they do like all the high res scanning for like the major. Okay, so it's like legit. It's like a big machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's okay. it's it's incredible, and yeah. that's how we did the. It Kobe. has to be right. Yeah, that's yeah. how we did the Kobe painting. I mean, okay. to get the files to the animators so they could really cut it apart, mm-hmm. you know, at a high res, which is apparently so awesome to use yeah and then so the opera house you know i didn't think too much about it and the night that it actually happened i had my friends on boats in the sydney harbor on ig live going hey james wish you were here i'm like oh my goodness this is ah uh, this this is actually crazy yeah. so i mean yeah it was too bad you couldn't go yeah because of COVID. i know right but it had you know friends i had one friend she was looking at her out her apartment and she saw it in Sydney. So I lived in Sydney for eight or nine years. So I mean. Was this a message to all your haters? Yes. Like, Fuck all my yeah. haters. Yeah, I right. Made it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, to, to have that, um, I mean, that's definitely, that's definitely my bucket list of things that I wanted to do. I love that. And I think, you know, I ticked that off. Now it's kind of like, well, you know, there is, there's talks of turning that experience into NFT and having the fish slightly move. That'd be cool. Yeah. How much money does it cost to make something in NFT? Like what's the team you have to hire? I mean, it's a tremendous amount of editing, a lot of still photography. Yeah, there is. I mean, there's, there's, there's certain ways around it. I mean, you can do a deal off the back end. Like what if we did made this an NFT? Yeah. Let's just walk us through this process. So we wanted to make this an NFT. Mm-hmm. You need to find someone that is actually working with the platforms to start with. Okay. I mean, for, for individuals to get onto one of the websites, they normally come back saying, you know, the, we are overwhelmed and uh, blah, oh, blah, blah, okay. blah, and all this stuff, right? So you need to- Because they're probably like a big name of some kind too. They yeah. want to make money ultimately. Right, yeah. so there's all these third Eyeballs. party brokers basically that get in there so you can get onto the, so they will then find the best deal and what platform is right for whatever you're doing. So they will take a, a chunk, a chunk, for that, and then you own a piece. I would imagine, right? Yeah. As the artist. Yeah. Okay. So you get a percentage, but then if you're collaborating, you know, with a famous singer or, or whatever, I mean, they'll take a, a chunk as well. Yeah. And then with the animators, you know, a lot of animators are payment up front, 
or they okay. want a percentage at the end instead. And a percentage at the end instead is actually quite an attractive package if it's done correctly. And if yeah. it goes for big money. Yeah, they'll yeah. make so much more than right. if they were to invoice for the, for the job to start with. So, I mean, there's many deals. I mean, animators are, are doing so much work nowadays because of NFT. So, I mean, it doesn't need to be costly at all. You know, if you do back-end deals... I just want to see this carousel moving. Yeah. That'd be amazing, I right? think about that all the time. Yeah. I'm like, how cool would that be? Yeah. And then the handbrake, too. You can kind of see that. Hat yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. The hand coming the out. Hand. Yeah. yeah. It, just, it just lends itself so well. Maybe then, this is their next NFT drop. Right. And what, the, what was the platform you dropped yours on? Uh, Maker's Place. Maker's Place, yeah. yeah. There's, there's so many platforms nowadays. But, yeah, the, the Kobe NFT drop... When is that, you think? We're not ready, as in we, we have to get a few things finished at the Chinese theatre before we want a drop date. But what we have in mind with the Chinese theatre is is huge. So, I mean, we're just going to shop platforms that are actually going to do us justice. Hopefully, we work on a shoe together. Oh. We're in potential discussion to make yeah. you do something cool. Right. We're not allowed to mention any names, are we? But we can, our, we can uh, mention colors. We can elude. Yeah. So, Which I would mean, be amazing. It's like, just a cool shoe with your touch in these colors, black, yellow, white. Right. And we love yellow, clearly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a truck out the front that's yellow. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely right. a theme. It's a, you know, there's a crazy mural that's yellow. I mean... When I was buying plants for the... The back patio. It's I yellow. really only had one color option. Right, and you've got yellow socks on. I do. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. surprise me at all. Was that thoughtful of the plants? Did you know? Absolutely. Oh, nice. Yeah. What was the question? If, if you I... like thought about the yellow plants, because yeah. it's happened to me on accident. Like people go to my Instagram, they're like, "Oh, it's really beautifully curated. Like it's all yellow." And yeah. I was like, "That's all of that's an accident." Really? Wow. Literally, <laughs> because the thing is, like, I was just doing as we're doing this project, the trucks yellow, and then it kind of took. Like, remember at some point you were like, oh, it'd be good to have the paint, the same color paint. Yeah. And then that became a thing. So now anytime I take a picture of this, also yellow. And then it started man, it started just having a thing, and now the shoe yeah. company, also yellow. Right, and I, I love this shoe company. Cat footwear I, is amazing. I mean... And so right? it's just all kind of taking on a life of its own, Yeah, which is amazing. I love the idea. Doing That's something nice. special with that. Well, listen, tell everyone where they can find you. They can find me at my studio which is at Le Pier Hotel in West Hollywood. Generally there, eight days a week. I feel like I've said that before. <laughs> Instagram, which is all my first names, plus art at the end. And that's the same with my website as well. James thanks Peter for coming on the podcast, yeah. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Sharing the story about the art. for the chat. <laughs>